There goes Spears, backs away from one, from another, from another, from another. Beautiful try. Unbelievable. Dupri again wide. Beautiful ball for Pierre Spears. Oh, Spears is straight through. Brilliant counter by the Bulls away. There goes Spears. Try number two for the Springbok flyer from the number eight position. I was blessed to grow up in a loving Christian home and both my parents had committed their lives to the full-time ministry of serving God and His people. In our little family, my parents, and my eldest sister Johanny, and my younger sister Stephanie and I were instructed in the way of the Lord and always placing Him first. We were taught the Word of God from an early age, learning it verse by verse and reciting it to guests visiting our home. And Psalm 1 verse 1 was my rectical verse and I rehearsed it over and over again, still remembering it today. So we were really basking in the love of the Lord and I felt blessed. And at a young age, I was starting to comprehend the true Father's heart for His children here on earth. There's always a very special bond between a mother and her firstborn son. And it was exactly the same with me. And I can remember the morning that Pierre was born. Uh, I got this special promise from the Word of God. Proverbs 3, trusting in the Lord, my child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with God and with people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. And don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. In primary school, I was excelling at academics and sport. And I was a happy child and was experiencing God's true blessings in my life. My parents loved each other and protected and challenged us on every level, always offering their support and motivation. And my father instilled a strong champion spirit within us, teaching us to believe that we are winners. And most importantly, that the best is yet to come, always. And that is what God wants for you, the best, and to prosper and that is something I only realized later. My mother, on the other hand, taught us the art of survival, and to live with endurance, and she taught us diligence and nurtured a fighter spirit within us, and never to give up in challenging times and to have patience and perseverance. At the time I went to high school, things started to change a bit. I was going through the typical changes a teenage boy experiences, wanting to impress the girls, but feeling insecure and looking terribly out of proportion with extra large ears, which seems to have lasted, and feet and experiencing problems with my skin and didn't play for the A team and wasn't popular. And the good thing was that my attitude was right and I always participated in as many events as I could. Knowing through what I'd been taught, the hard work and the good attitude is what pulls you through.
my parents were going through a crisis in their marriage and it became evident that my pretty picture of a home was going to change. And you know, Satan has a way of stealing your inheritance and happiness if you do not nurture and take good care of what God has entrusted to you. I mean, things like your marriage and your talents or your gifts. He likes to destroy those things if you not nurture it. And at the age of 15, my parents chose to get a divorce. And I was asking more and more questions about life and God, and especially how a loving God could allow this to happen. I mean, why does bad things happen to good people? I mean, why do families get separated? I realized only later that this isn't God's plan, that we live and die simply by the decisions we make. And God says in Deuteronomy 30, that I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing, so choose life. And a lot of times we blame God for the decisions we make. So this was a very big blow to my world, having parents that is separated, and my picture of a family was shattered. Now, no more family holidays, or Christmases, or birthdays. The security was plucked out from under me. Through this pain, I made a decision that one day I would learn from the mistakes my parents made. And you also have that. You can also make that decision. You know, it's not good enough to say because your parents did it, that is why you are doing it. You're far better than that. So turn your pain around and learn from it. You can do it. You have that ability. And I did it. But instead of seeking God in all my pain, I found consolation with my friends and became more and more influenced by the group. Peer pressure, like what people thought of me, trying to become someone else, initiated a lifestyle of self-centeredness. And I was always in pursuit of acceptance and acknowledgement, but ironically, only feeding the void in my soul. Always being empty when I was alone. And you know, God, People say there's a God-created void in our hearts that only God can fill and I realized that later in my life and I tell you that today that you may fill that void with whatever you want but that was created for God and a relationship with God. I was living with my mother and two sisters, and as a family, we were going through some really challenging times. My eldest sister, Yohani, was a full-time student studying law, and myself and Stephanie were both still at high school. And at the age of 40 years old, having been a stay-at-home mom, my mother decided to study a degree in law in pursuit of her independence and um, financial freedom. So this was adding a lot of pressure to our situation, and financially, we were straining to make ends meet. I remember a time I invited friends over to our house and advising them that they could only come and visit because we didn't have enough food to give them to eat. And uh, nowadays we joke about it, but things were quite tough. But it was during this time that my sister Yohani, in her final year of her LLB, being 22 years old, fell pregnant with her longtime boyfriend from high school. And this was a big challenge for us as a family. A family so committed to God, I was asking myself, what would everyone say again? And how would this look to the world outside? And our moral core values were really in question again. The one who was faced with the choice so many women are faced with today, the question of having an abortion. And this proved to be the easy way out and something we didn't grow up with. And in our home, we were taught that to discipline and the pain of discipline is worth more than the pain of shame. And taking responsibility was the right thing to do. It would bring forth fruit in the long run. And you only chose to take that responsibility for our actions and not to give up, but to follow through with the pregnancy. And God blessed her with a beautiful baby girl called Mila, two weeks before her final LRB exam, which she passed. And Mila was a miracle and came to us in such a difficult time. And today we cannot even imagine our lives without this little princess. Now she's seven years old and a bundle of life-giving joy.
It was a very difficult time in my life. I was in my final years of studies in my LLB. But I just knew that I had to go through this. I just knew I had to do it. And although things were crazy and insane and I was so emotional and it was just dark, I just knew and thank God for the support network I had that I had to go through with it. And while you're in a situation and it seems so dark and so impossible, you cannot comprehend and you cannot make sense of why this is happening to you. But when I'm looking back, I can see the result and the joy that Mila brought to my life and why it had to happen and how I can help girls and people with any difficulties they face today um, by telling them what happened to me and, and how to go through it. My father taught us that if we continue doing the same things that other people were doing, we would never be different. And I wanted to be different, and I'm sure you want to be here as well. And I knew God blessed me with a sporting talent. And in this difficult time, I chose to be different, and I started making a few decisions. I wanted to be the fastest and the strongest and the best at what I did. When my father was young, he was a prominent sports figure in South Africa at selling at athletics and rugby and representing South Africa and playing for the Bulls. And I had the blessing of inheriting these genes, yet talent is never enough, as you might know. My father had taught me that the seeds of discipline and sacrifice needed to be sown for the harvest of success to come in. You need to do the hard work. You need to make a sacrifice if you want to be successful. And I had to make a commitment. And at that stage, it was the only thing I was sure of in my life. Success is not the blaze of sudden glory one. Okay, it is the effort of adding up of strong work done. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something you gotta keep on doing and you gotta keep on keeping on. I was in the gym every morning at 5 a.m. and playing rugby after school. And then we had choir in the evenings because I enjoyed music and grew up with it. And still, then there would need to be time for academics. And this was such a busy time. But before I knew it, I was in grade 12 and in my final year of high school. And I had grown from a small, out of proportion teen to a tall, strong and fast young man. And I started reaping the reward of those disciplined decisions. Not partying when my mates did and to train when they didn't. And by the end of that year, I finished first in South Africa with discus and I was third with the shot put. And I even qualified for the World Juniors in athletics. I was chosen as a Cranwick captain and I was excelling at my rugby. And I was confronted with a career in professional sport, either in athletics or in rugby. But at the end, I chose rugby. So after high school, I signed a contract with the Blue Bulls Union and I was given a full bursary for studying at the University of Pretoria. This was awesome and I experienced my independence. All my studies were paid and my contract allowed me financial independence. I really started experiencing the glory and the reliance of myself, which was wrong, but I didn't realize it. My first year I was chosen for the South African and the 19 team and the media started paying attention to me. I was labeled as one of the next best things in South African rugby, and I was really experiencing the honor of man. And I was riding this wave of glory, and at this World Cup tournament, the unexpected happened. At this high I was, I was riding, the unexpected happened, and I broke my arm. The break was pretty bad, and the injury would initially take me out for at least two months, and that is why I still today strapped my arm. And I was again asking so many questions, and um, this was supposed to be the time I had my breakthrough. And after everything I had invested, all the hard work I did, and finally getting a breakthrough, why is this happening again, Lord? Why me now? Why now at this time? And I didn't really understand it, but my grandmother, she gave me John 13 verse 7, which I would read quickly. And it says, Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. And I found peace with that. But you know, God has a plan with everything. 
God had a plan with my broken arm. And my arm did not heal and my injury turned into a 10 month period of no play, which was pretty tough. And I was thinking this was a great time to commit to my studies because I was still in my first year, but it turned out to be the perfect excuse for a party. Being a first year student, I was young and I started hanging out in clubs, drinking and slowly losing my focus, which had driven me to succeed and getting me to the place I was. And I was in a very bad space. My dad kept motivating me by saying I had to remain positive and that the best was yet to come. But it was a pretty tough thing to do. Because by the end of 2004 and by the end of my first year, I had no goal, no motivation and I was totally unfocused. And on top of all this, my arm wouldn't heal. It was at this time I believed things could not get any worse. And that I got the shocking news one morning from my mother that my father had a heart attack and he had died at the age of 53. Why is this happening now? I need my dad, and I need my father, and I need my mentor now at this stage of my life. But I only realized God had other plans, and he had a better plan. God always had a better plan. And I was immediately confronted with life, and mortality, and eternity, thinking about what happens after this. This was the moment my life started to change. I started asking what was the goal of my life, could it be that God had a plan with my life? Could it be that I desperately needed to get my life right with God? I wasn't sure what would happen to me if I died. And you need to ask yourself that as well. I knew I needed to connect with God and make a few radical decisions of what I believed in regarding my relationships, regarding training, and regarding my social life. Because that, that are the things that influence us most and influence our faith the most. cornerstone of my security, like a father should be. And he was my foundation and my protection and my guidance. He was big, he was six foot four inches and had an aura around him. When he walked into a room, people knew about him. He had a fantastic sense of humor. He was multi-talented. He played the piano and the guitar, which he taught himself. And he wrote the most incredible letters to us as kids. Always sent us motivational texts, and always inspiring us. He believed in me and he raised us for one great goal which I only realized later and that was to do great things for the kingdom of God. He used to call himself the Grootlu which means the mighty lion and he used to call me the Kleinlu which is the little lion and my father taught us to always be the best you can be and he wrote each one of us a song for me and my two sisters when we were little and mine went something like this my name is Obut, and I'm my basketball. I'm not my bayak klein, but I love this kind of brill. 